Lecture 2.3, Proof of Kepler's Laws. Okay, so now we're in a position to prove Kepler's laws from basic Newtonian mechanics. It turns out that um, Kepler's second law is the easiest to prove, so we'll start with that. Uh, remember, Kepler's second law claims that planets sweep out equal areas in equal time intervals. So what we're going to do is uh, look at an infinitesimal change in the angular position theta of the planet as it's going around its orbit. So um, if the planet changes by an amount d theta, um, we can construct a little uh, triangle, which is shaded here, dA. So the distance from the sun out to the, to the orbit, that, that length is r. The, the uh, kind of the width of the end of the triangle is just r d theta. And so that area is just going to be the area of the triangle, which is 1 half r times r d theta. Don't worry that this that we're missing a little piece here. Uh, again, these are infinitesimal values. So when you take the limit of d theta going to zero, uh, this little bit that we missed becomes insignificant. So the area that our planet sweeps out in an infinitesimal uh, d theta is 1 half r squared d theta. And so therefore, Kepler's second law uh, claims that if, well, if you sweep out equal areas in equal time intervals, what that means is that the time derivative of the area swept out by the planet is just a constant. So Kepler's second law claims that 1 half r squared d theta dt is a constant. To prove that this is true, we're going to use conservation of angular momentum. So angular momentum, the magnitude of angular momentum, is the planet's mass times r times the theta or tangential component of its velocity. So since we know that angular momentum is conserved, this quantity is a conserved quantity. So we're going to use the result from the previous lecture that v theta is r d theta dt. We can now take an r d theta dt up in this expression, we know that that's just equal to v theta. So dA dt is just 1 half r v theta. So we've just made a substitution here. Uh, and now, since uh, we could solve for v, we can solve for r times v theta as just the angular momentum over m. So we're going to replace r uh, v theta was just L over M. So we we can see that dA dt is just L over 2M. Since angular momentum is a constant, therefore dA over dt is a constant. And that's what we set out to prove. So again, Kepler's Kepler came up with his second law before Newtonian in physics was invented. So his observation from the motion of the planet Mars that uh, uh, that this kind of thing is true uh, predates the idea of the concept of conservation of angular momentum. But uh, we've just shown that those two those two things are mathematically the same. Okay, now let's move on to Kepler's first law. We want to show that Newtonian physics uh, predicts that the path of a planet under gravitational uh, force uh, follows the equation of an ellipse. So this uh, takes a little bit more doing, but we can do it. We'll start with the planet's acceleration. So uh, we take uh, Newton's uh, uh, Newton's law of universal gravity and plug it into f equals ma uh, to get this 
expression we cancel the masses of the planets because we have mass times acceleration is equal to that force so the masses of the planets cancel out so the acceleration is just given by this remember that um, we can write our well we can write the time derivative of the theta hat unit vector in terms of the r hat unit vector so what that means is we can solve for r hat here in terms of d theta hat dt so if we divide through by a negative d theta dt r hat is just minus 1 over d theta dt times d theta hat dt so what we're going to do is now substitute this expression for r hat into the equation of motion to get this so we have that the acceleration of the planet is again minus gm over r squared and then you get this thing is just that is a fancy way or a complicated way of writing the r hat unit vector uh, we can rearrange uh, to uh, bring this uh, d theta dt we'll you know we'll, we'll we'll bring it out with the r squared term and this is all just times d theta hat dt we now want to write that r squared d theta dt term in terms of angular momentum so we want to get rid of this so that we can write it in terms of angular momentum so the angular momentum is mr v theta remember v theta is r d theta dt so that's where the r squared comes from thus we can substitute that term r squared d theta dt is just equal to the angular momentum divided by the mass of the planet so remember that this is the expression from the previous slide for the acceleration of the planet we can now take this thing in the denominator here the r squared d theta dt and just write that as l over m so in other words the acceleration of our planet is gmm over angular momentum times d theta hat dt and so we now have to integrate this thing so let's uh, multiply both sides of the equation by dt so the dt's cancel out and then we're going to integrate each side so the left hand side is going to be an integral of dv on the right hand side we're just integrating the d theta hat with the gmm over l pulled out as constants so um, when we integrate the dv integral of dv that's a perfect derivative so we just get velocity out when we integrate the d theta we just get theta theta hat out but there's going to be a constant so there's going to be a constant of integration and we're just going to call that some constant d times the y hat direction so why is that well this integration constant uh, is tied to the initial conditions when we're integrating so we could pick anything if we start our integration uh, at perihelion um, the theta hat uh, unit vector is pointing up in the positive y hat direction and so as we integrate all the way around and then back again this constant term uh, turns out to be some number which we don't know this is just a constant d which we don't know yet uh, times this y hat direction again it's tied to the initial conditions so if we divide through both sides of the equation by gmm over l bring it over on that side you get theta hat plus dy hat and now what we're going to do is take the dot product of this result with theta hat so if we take the the dot product uh, 
we take the dot product of each term v dot theta hat is just v theta theta hat dot theta hat is just one it's a unit vector and y dot theta is just cosine theta that's because remember theta hat uh, is minus sine theta x hat but when you take a dot product with y hat all you're doing is pulling out that cosine theta term in front of the y hat so this dot product is cosine theta so this this simplifies to this expression we substitute uh, v, we want to get rid of that v theta in terms of the angular momentum vector. So v theta is just r d theta dt. We've done this before, um, that we can like write this in terms of the angular momentum vector like that. It was on the previous page. So v theta is L over MR, so we get an L squared. Uh, we get an m squared and then we pick up an r on the bottom and now uh, we're almost there we can solve for the radius here in terms of the rest of all that other stuff so we cross multiply by r and divide through by one plus t cosine theta so we get r as a function of theta equals this so what we want to do is now com is we want to compare this expression this this result that we've derived with the equation for an ellipse so we see that the equation for an ellipse is some constants up top divided by one plus a constant times cosine theta and that's what we've got we've got some constants divided by one plus a constant times cosine theta so this has the same mathematical form in terms of theta it's the same functional form in terms of theta as an ellipse. By comparing these two equations, we can see that that d, d constant that came out of our integration must equal the eccentricity of the ellipse for these two things to be equal. So that constant d must equal the eccentricity. So we'll make that substitution to find that the radius the radial coordinate of our planet as a function of theta is now equal to this and again this has the same form uh, as an ellipse so we've shown that uh, the planet must trace out an elliptical orbit we also get a bonus here by comparing this constant out in front the l squared over gm squared m with this constant, we can set those two things equal to each other to show that the angular momentum, we can write the angular momentum in terms of the masses of the objects, uh, the semi-major axis, and the eccentricity. So before, um, we only had the equation of the planetary ellipse in terms of just geometrical variables that didn't have any physical significance. We have now derived what the path of the planet is in terms of physical quantities, in terms of angular momentum and masses. Okay, let's uh, use this previous result to calculate the velocity of a planet at perihelion and at aphelion. So this is the result we're using. Uh, the fact that we can write the angular momentum in terms of the semi-major axis and eccentricity. So what we're going to do is uh, write the angular momentum as mass times the tangential velocity times the radial coordinate. So plug that in for, for L. And then we're going to now solve for V theta. So we just divide through by m times r. So this, the mass of the planet cancels out one. Well, the mass of the planet ca cancels out the mass over here. This is this m squared is under the square root. So this guy cancels that. 
and then we'll divide through by r. When it goes under the square root, we'll have an r squared. OK, since we're evaluating the angular momentum at, say, the perihelion point, um, the velocity vector must be purely in the tangential direction. It must be purely in the v theta. There's no radial component here because the planet is neither getting closer nor farther away from the star at this point. It's just going perpendicularly upward, perpendicular to uh, its position vector. So what that means is that this v theta component must just equal the speed, the total speed of the planet. There is no vr component. So the magnitude of v theta is just the magnitude of the velocity. At perihelion, we know that the perihelion distance is semi-major axis times 1 minus e. So we'll take this and plug it in for r squared here. So that so we get an a squared times 1 minus e squared in the denominator. Let's um, write the 1 minus e squared as 1 minus e times 1 plus e. And the 1 minus e quantity squared is just 1 minus e times 1 minus e. So the 1 minus e's cancel out. Uh, the a uh, upstairs cancels one of the, the one of the a's downstairs, and we find that the perihelion velocity is equal to this. It's the square root of gm over a times one plus e uh, divided by one minus e. So you might remember from a previous lecture that the velocity of a circular orbit was the square root of gm over r. So if the eccentricity of uh, our ellipse is zero, these, this term here is just one. So one plus zero divided by one minus zero is just one. The semi-major axis A is just the radius of the ellipse. And so we see that this uh, expression simplifies to the square root of gm over r, which is what you get for a circular orbit. So that's a good uh, reality check to make sure that our result is um, is correct. So we found that at perihelion, that's the velocity. You can do a similar analysis by plugging in the aphelion distance and show that you basically just flip the, the negative and the positive signs here. So now it's 1 minus e over 1 plus e. Um, and another interesting result is that if you take the ratio of uh, the perihelion velocity to the aphelion velocity, um, you can show that this ratio is just 1 plus e over 1 minus e. I'll leave that for you to work out on your own, but it's a nice simple result. So let's uh, just for fun calculate the perihelion aphelion velocity of the Earth as it goes around the Sun. So we need to know the gravitational constant, it's this. Mass of the sun is that. Semi-major of the Earth's axis is that. That's 1 AU. And the eccentricity of the Earth's orbit is 0.0167. So if you just plug those in, you find that the perihelion velocity is about 30.288 kilometers per second. The aphelion velocity is a little bit less, 29.293. So if you look at the ratio of those, you get about a 3.4% difference. So um, when the Earth is closest to the sun, it's going about 3.4% faster than when it's farthest away from it. All right, so finally, let's prove Kepler's third law, that the period squared of the planetary orbit is proportional to the uh, semi-major axis cubed. 
Uh, to prove this, we're going to use Kepler's second law, which says that the time derivative of the area swept out by a planet is just the angular momentum over uh, two times the mass of the planet. Since this derivative is a constant, we can replace the derivative with any kind of approximation to the derivative. So what we're going to do is imagine uh, the, the planet sweeps out one complete orbit. So uh, dA is just the area of the entire ellipse, which from a previous slide was pi times a times b. The time for the planet to sweep out one complete ellipse is just the period. So dA dt is just pi ab over the period. And from Kepler's second law, we know that this is just equal to the angular momentum over twice the mass of the planet. We want to get rid of the semi-minor axis, b, so we'll use this relationship between the eccentricity, b, and a. We'll solve for b to find that it's equal to a times the square root of 1 minus e squared. And now take this and plug this in for b. So we get pi times a squared times the square root of 1 minus e squared in the numerator. So we'll square both sides of the equation and then solve for p. So we'll square both sides, move the p to the other side, divide by l over 2m. So we get that p squared is equal to that. There it is again. So we're trying to show that p squared is proportional to a cubed and nothing else. So let's um, let's get rid, we want to get rid of the angular momentum and the eccentricity. So we'll use this result um, in our derivation from Kepler's first law for the angular momentum. We'll take this and we'll plug this in for L squared. So here we've just uh, written, we've just brought this result down here, plugged in for L squared. So the stuff under the square root is just this right here. The m's cancel, the 1 minus e squareds cancel, and that 1a cancels one of the a's up top. Uh, and so this is what we get. We get that the period squared is 4 pi squared over gm times a cubed. So you might remember this is exactly what we got for a circular orbit. So it turns out that that result that we derive for a circular orbit applies to more general orbits, to elliptical orbits as well. So um, anyway, this is a proof of Kepler's third law. And we also now have a way of evaluating what that constant is, k, um, in the original version. So k is just 4 pi squared over gm. So again, remember when we were looking at the, the log log graph, we said that, that that constant k depended on the mass of the central object. Well, now we see that that's true. So k is inversely proportional to that central mass. Uh, Kepler's third law is actually a really powerful tool in astronomy. It's the way that we get masses of almost everything uh, that we can measure masses for. So, for example, uh, we can actually measure the mass of the sun. We can weigh the sun by looking at the motion of the planets going around it. So we could pick any planet orbiting the sun to do this. Uh, let's pick the Earth to weigh the sun. We know that the semi-major axis of the Earth's orbit is 1 AU, which is that. A year, if you just multiply 365.24 days times 24 hours in a day and 3,600 seconds in an hour, you get this, that there's about 31 million seconds in a year. Uh, and so we can plug in for 
the semi-major axis and the period and then solve for the mass of the sun. Uh, so plug in the values, you get 1.99 times 10 to the 30th kilograms, which is uh, consistent with a value that's found in the back of your book. So again, by watching the motion of something up orbiting something else, uh, if you can get its period and the, the semi-major axis, you can weigh the object. And again, this is how we determine the masses of almost everything in the universe from uh, black holes. If you can watch a star orbit a black hole, you can get its mass. Or if you can see two black holes orbiting each other, you can get the mass. Um, you can get uh, masses of galaxies this way. Uh, just about everything, this is how you weigh stuff in astronomy. Okay, so here's a list of uh, some of the variables and parameters that we've been using so far. We're kind of getting a pile of them. So I've tried to organize them. So the parameters in this first box are purely geometrical. They don't have to do with physical things like mass or energy or anything like that. These are just purely uh, geometrical parameters defining the ellipse. The mass and the uh, gravitational constant, these are physical parameters. Angular momentum is a conserved quantity, so I'll, it's a special case. And then all the kinematic variables are over here that we've defined so far. So kinematic meaning things that depend on the motion uh, of the planet orbiting the sun. Um, so here's our variables so far. It's kind of uh, fun to organize the equations that we've derived uh, to see what variables they relate. So um, for example, that e squared equals 1 minus b squared over a squared, that equation just relates those geometric parameters that define an ellipse. Our result uh, that uh, for Newton's third law, that p squared is 4 pi squared over gma cubed, that relates a geometric elliptical parameter, the semi-major axis, uh, to a kinematic variable, the period, and also a physical quantity, the mass of the stars. Our uh, we have two equations for the uh, defining the ellipse of the planet. So we, you know, R of as a function of theta. The original definition is just purely an ellipse. So we have R and theta are only dependent on uh, A and E. So those are just the geometrical parameters. But then we also derived R of theta in terms of the angular momentum and the masses of the star and the planet and the eccentricity of the orbit. So here, this equation uh, brings in the physical quantities, whereas this equation left those out. This is just purely geometrical. So anyway, you can take a look at this, and if this is helpful uh, for organizing the results, then great. If not, don't worry about it. In the next uh, lecture, we'll talk about the uh, energetics of orbits and relate them to uh, more general orbits, um, including hi hyperbolic and parabolic orbits.